Thank you. Good catch there, Erica. That's what you get for being Johnny Come Early. No sound. Wow. Hadn't done that in a while. Whew. All right. Let's rock and roll. All right. So let's um let's continue, shall we? Now I got to cut the front part of this video. So good good afternoon. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Bible study Tuesday. I'm sorry, Bible study Thursday. Um, we're going to rock John's chapter two, and I'm going to have to edit this before I put it on. Ah! Um, questions, comments, thoughts, go ahead and put comments, um, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with them in the order that we get them as best we can. Well, all right. Okay, let's rock and roll, shall we? Um, I want to back up just a second to this verse right here, verse 12. Um, his mother and his brothers and his disciples. Um, you'll notice the text note says that, he, that, that uh, Delphoi is plural. It could be uh, sisters as well. Um, Luther um, also sort of comments on this, just a, a sort of a touch, that um, he believes that, these, that Adelphoi here is cousins, not... Um, not brothers. He believes that Mary remained a virgin, but that is neither here nor there. A little bit of of um, of fun from Luther. Fun with flags. Fun with Luther doesn't work. Laughing with Luther. That's better. All right, chapter uh, two, verse thirteen. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we are in chapter 2. And we're about to have a story from Matthew 21. So how does this work? Um, how does this? Um, how does the timing work on this? Um, is a good question. And Luther says, um, I don't know. And I can't reconcile them. Um, but obviously, uh, obviously John isn't putting together a, a chronological gospel. This happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. Um, I think the key to understanding this is the Passover is near. And the and so um, the Passover is the anchor in John's gospel. Um, test me on it, if you wish, um, of some important events. And the, the Passover culminates with the Passover, which is Jesus's... Um, death on the cross. And so, um, uh, as you sort of, um, work your way through this text, um, I wouldn't worry. It's not a big deal about what happens when obviously the triumphant entry and the, um, the, the cleansing of the temple in every other gospel appears around the same time as the triumphant entry. They go in, he goes into Jerusalem and then he, he cleanses the temple um, in John's gospel, it happens after his first miracle. Why? Why does he cho choose to group those two things together? Well, because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think it's because of this very part right here. Um, the Passover was near. So what we've got is basically, this is... Um, I don't think he cleanses the temple twice, Steve. Uh, I, I don't... I don't, um, I don't mind that, but um, I don't think it's necessary for this to go on. It, we simply should understand John's style. I think that's a better sort of thing. That John isn't chronological, and the and and that should sort of also shape our understanding of Revelation as well. If John isn't chronological with the gospel that he writes, he isn't chronological also in the Revelation. Let's let, let straight from Luther. 
Uh, now the question arises, how do we harmonize uh, the accounts of two evangelists, Matthew or John? Uh, for Matthew writes what happened on Palm Sunday when the Lord made his entry into Jerusalem. And here in John, we read that all had occurred at the time of Passover that followed Christ's baptism, the same Passover season during which the miraculous changing of water into wine also took place. And then Christ moved to Capernaum, for Christ was baptized in the Epiphany season. And it seems possible that he tarried the short time until Passover in Capernaum, preaching there and cleansing the temple at the Passover in which John writes. These are problems that will remain problems. I shall venture to sell them no further, says Luther, nor are they essential. I love it. I love it. You should love it too. Not a problem. Not what this is about. Um, not the main focus of this. Um, so a better question is, what is John trying to do by saying he cleanses the temple around Passover? I think the key is understanding the Passover. That Christ is the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That's the key, I think. But you're free to um, move about the cabin and um, come up with whatever you think is the best way of going about it. In the temple, he found, he found those up. Uh, so what he finds and what we find, <laughs> uh, this is about the 15th time we've had the verb find in two chapters. Um, the apostles found the Christ. Jesus found sinners. Just a thought. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Uh, Thor is uh, sleeping in the um, in my chair over there. Um, I came back um, with a burr in my saddle. I wanted to, um, I think it's time for me to sort of um, stop playing around with my Mac Pro and basically sell it. And so I'm going to sell my uh, Mac Pro and I'm just getting it ready for sale. And that means that like my desk is like a mess and the floor is a mess. And and uh, that doesn't bode well for Thor, who is very, very sort of anxious with change. So while I'm working on the computer underneath the desk, he's just sitting there shaking. And so um, his take on it is that he's finally getting some R&R &R as the floor is at least clean because you were coming to visit. Uh, but the desk is still a mess. So, like, I mean, why am I, why do I have a screwdriver over here? Well, I have a screwdriver over here because I'm cleaning the MacBook Pro up for sale. But anyway, yeah, I took a 2009 MacBook, a Mac, Mac Pro, the cheese grater model, and I updated it and updated it, and it runs faster than most modern PCs, uh, most modern computers. And so I'm, it's time for me to sort of sell that and move on. I wish more people had the humility to say that we really don't know. It would stop a lot of these false teachings. Exactly right. Um, um, <laughs> I feel bad for me send popcorn. Uh, I like that. And I like that too. I like them both. Uh, both uh, Thor and Steve's having a good day. Um, all right. Um, making a whip out of cords. He drove them out of the temple. He exorcised the temple. That's what he basically did. To drive out is to exorcise. I have exorcised the demon from, um, from uh, uh, Ace Ventura. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. The only shep, uh, sheep that is going to be sacrificed in that temple is the Paschal Lamb. Our Paschal Lamb that sets us free is sacrificed, O oh, keep. Easter him. Um, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the money changers and overturned the tables. So he, he turns the tables on them. Um, I think this is important 
for us to sort of understand something about what's going on. And, 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 and the important thing is he's making the temple ready for his sacrifice. His sacrifice, which is going to make you and me acceptable to God. His sacrifice of his body on the cross. His shedding of his blood. And whether this happens early or late, it doesn't change the fact that the important thing is, um, is what Christ is doing. Um, I love this also that you, you should take a note that Luther, that Luther places things in their liturgical context. He talks about this being an epiphany because uh, the first miracle is an epiphany. And we should learn to live this way um, because I think it's important for us to learn to live in the life of the church. You see, the scriptures aren't detached from what's going on in the church. And, it, and there's, a, there's a rhythm to the church. Whether you're on the three or the one year series, there's a rhythm. And you should think um, of, of some events as, 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 as connected to the Lord's epiphany. Him showing himself and that's one of those things is the water into wine episode. And that's, I'm not, I'm not making a law. I'm just saying that you, you, it's not you and the scriptures alone. Um, it's not you versus the scriptures. It's you in the context of the church reading the scriptures. And that's why we read them together. Um, they, they occur within the life of faith. Um, just a thought. I mean, you don't, I mean, just a thought. I, like the, we're actually reading the scriptures differently than they, than they did um, a thousand years ago. Um, and I think that the way the way the scriptures were read a thousand years ago is kind of important. Always connected to church. And that's not to say that reading at home is bad. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that read the scriptures connected to the Sunday services. There's not a, you don't have a churchy life and then a home life. Uh, the two are together. Your church life is your home life. Your home life is your church life. Um, we we compartmentalize everything. Um, this occurs with parents who will allow their kids to watch certain programs at home, but if we were to watch them at church, they would lose their stuffing. But you're watching them at home. Well, you know what I mean. I, like that's home. It's not church. The one who took on your flesh took on your flesh at home and he took on your flesh at church. There's... Second thing to think about with this text is, is Jesus angry? And how do we hang handle this? Uh, turning tables is an abusive char characteristic. Is, G is Jesus the abusive? Abuser. Um, also on this is... Um, um, I also would sort of take into account um, the, 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 the thrust, especially in the 60s, that Jesus is this revolutionary. He, he turns the tables on the establishment. Those sort of, of understandings of Jesus miss the point. Uh, and the point is, he's cleansing the temple for the sacrifice, which is going to make him and you acceptable to God. That's what's going on. That's what's going on. He makes it. Ex he makes you acceptable to God. He makes you forgiven by what he's going to do in the temple. Is this a sin? No, there is a, there is anger that isn't sin. That's Ephesians five. Um, also, I would um, there's righteous indignation. If someone steals your your dog, and you get upset and angry about it, that's not a sin. To be angry at someone for doing evil to you. 
The problem is that we cross into sin. We end up at sin. We, 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 we sort of always take it too far when keeping it real goes wrong. And so what I would say is, is, um, is that sort of handles all of this. He is consumed with saving you. They're in the way of it. It was big business. Um, it was big business to, 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 to sell things. It's a one-stop shop. It was convenient. You could just go there and you could get all this stuff, except where they set up shop was in the court of the Gentiles. The place which... Um, the place which God set aside for the sake of the Gentiles, for them to worship. And so this, this business is getting away of God saving people. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. No. He told them who sold the pigeons. Take them away. Um, Don't make my father's house into a market house, a house of trade. We're at work. What's going on, buddy? Is there somebody in the in the um, office? We're working. Hmm. Hi, Rick. It's good to see you. It's good to see me back at it. Um, I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. Um, thanks for thanks for checking on me, Rick. Um, hey, buddy. And there it goes. All right, so his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for his house will consume me, will consume me. Zeal zeal for your house will consume me. So it's zeal for the Father. It's you that this is about. Don't miss this. This isn't about Jesus as revolutionary, Jesus as as sort of crazy man. This is about Jesus saving you. Me too. This is about Christ, who he is, what he does, how he is. He's the God who saves. He's the God who saves. So they, so they, um, so the Jews, aha, second engagement of the Jews. The Jews said to him, what sign are you able to give us for doing these things? You know, like, who do you think you are for messing up the business in front of the temple? Who are you? Who do you think you are? What sign do you do these things? Jesus answered them, 
destroy the temple, this temple, and in three days I will raise it. Now, again, remember at the beginning of this chapter, we had the very, very odd on the third day of the feast. And I told you, there's no way that that's not a signal. And here, 19 verses later, we have another third day reference. Don't miss this. Three days, eschatological wedding feast, the Son of Man coming in his glory with good wine. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it back in three days. What sign do you have? Well, you destroy that temple. I will raise it back in three days. The Jews answered, uh, the Jews then said, um, for 46, 40 and 6 years, it has taken to build the temple that temple and you will raise it in three days but he was speaking of the temple of his body he was speaking of the temple of his body his body broken for you his blood shed for you. That's what he was talking about. The temple of his body. That's what this is all about. That's what this means. That's what's going on. Don't miss this. That's what was going on earlier and that's what's going on now. Don't miss this. That's the important thing. That's why he cleanses the temple. He says why he does it. Destroy this temple and I will build it back in three days. It's like 46 years to build this temple. You're going to knock it down. You're going to build it back up again in three days. But he was speaking concerning the temple of his body, which will be broken on Passover with the lambs that are slain. It all connects together with John. Why is it here? Because of the temple. He's the Passover lamb. This is not about what happens when. This is about what this is all about for John. It's about what this is all about. That's what this is about. And when he had risen from the dead on the third day. See, I can't get past it. Why do we, why is it always about Jesus? Because it's always about Jesus. Why are you stuck on the cross of Christ? Because Jesus is stuck on the cross of Christ. Why are you consumed with the death and resurrection of Christ? It, 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 it's, it's, it's all we ever hear. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Because Jesus is consumed about it. Are you reading this book with me? That's what it's all about. It's not about the hokey pokey. It's about his body broken on the cross, raised from the dead on the third day. Destroy this temple and I'll build it back in three days. We preach Christ and him crucified. Because that's what we're called to preach. 
Nothing wrong with you uh, kicking alcoholism. Nothing wrong with how to have your best life. Nothing wrong with you being success, successful. I personally am one of the most positive people that you'll ever meet. But that doesn't save. It just means I'm fun in a pinch. What saves is destroy this temple and I will build it back in three days. That's what saves. And I, I want you to sort of take this in for a second because it's so important. Without this, we have no preaching. Without this, we have no hope. Without this, we're nothing. But with this, even you and I are saved. With this, we have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. With this, coronavirus isn't going to kill us. With this, um, Take they our goods, fame, child, and wife, these all be gone. The victory won. The kingdom ours remaineth. Because of Jesus. Because of his suffering and death. Why are you so stuck on the cross? Because Jesus is stuck on the cross. Stuck on you. I got this feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose. I got too low there. Anyway, got too low there. Um, when he had raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had spoken this. And they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. I think this might be the last time Logos appears, but we can we can check later on. Um, they believe the scripture and the word. John chapter 20, they don't believe yet. John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene will grab Peter and John. They'll go to the tomb. They'll see the tomb empty and they'll go home. And John will say, because we did not believe it, we did not know the scripture that he was to raise from the dead. They believed him to be dead. This gives you the end end. They're going to they're gonna get a clue. They don't understand it right now. And that's what's so important about this as well. How real is this? They don't know what's going on. But we know. There's no denying it. He's the Christ. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Paschal lamb. It's right there. And when he raises from the dead on the third day, when he weddings at Cana's it, we'll be saved. He was crucified for our sins. He was raised for our justification before the Father. Now we have three verses which are going to take us the rest of the time. Because these three verses appear on Holy Monday and they are the worst law of all time. Because they cut to the heart of who we are and what we're really about. who we are, and what we're really about. Now, 
Now, when he was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem for the Passover, a lot of Passover in two chapters. Paschal. Into Paschal. Why is he the Paschal lamb? He's the Passover lamb. Paschal, Passover. Many believed in his name, seeing the signs which he did. So, already in chapter 2, many believed the signs that he did. It's right there in the text. Even some from the Pharisees do. I'm sorry. This isn't in... Um, this isn't in Holy Week. This is... Um, but it is in Lent. So, how does Jesus handle this popularity? How does he handle likes on Facebook? Jesus did not faith himself to them because he knew all people and needed nothing to bear witness concerning men for he knew what was inside of man. They get all wrapped up in him. They believe in him. He does not believe himself to them. Same word. They faith him. He doesn't faith them. He doesn't put his trust in them. His popularity, their excitement concerning him, how great he is, how wonderful he is, how his YouTube videos are at the top of the charts. He doesn't entrust himself to them. Let's see if I can show you this. It's the same word. Many believed. Many believed. They believed. They believed. See the same word? This is the same word as this. I'll highlight it for you. There it is. They didn't, you can see it in the Latin. They didn't creed. They creeded him. They believed in him, but he didn't creed them. Why? Why doesn't he get wrapped up in what's going on? Why? What does this say about us? What does it say that he knows what's going on in men? He doesn't need to have a. T he doesn't need somebody to testify concerning it. Think about it. Think about it. What's it mean? How is this devastating law? They aren't trustworthy. We aren't trustworthy. In the course of human events, God has had many times people say the sentence, I'm totally on your side. I commit myself to you. I have decided to follow you. I found you. He goes and finds them and then they say, "We I found you. Look, look, I get the credit for having found you." Where are you, God? Are you lost? Can I rescue you?
from Peter on. Cain. Adam. Oh, yeah, great plan, God. I'm on board. Every tree but that one. Totally. And they all fail. We all fail. How many people have made commitments to God, made pledges to God, made vows to God, only to break them the same day? See this in churches. We'll do this good thing if this happens. That happens. Ah, we still can't do this good thing. Um, if, if God does this in our midst, then we'll do it. And then that happens too. And we're like, eh, still not ready to pull the trigger. He knows what's going on in you. And it ain't good. It ain't pretty. He knows your sin. He knows your death. This is a devastating word. They believe in him. He doesn't trust himself over to them. And he doesn't need someone to tell him what's going on with men. She's right. He knows what's going on with you. There simply isn't a reason for you to make promises to him. He knows you're not going to keep them. And for such promise breakers who confess their sins, their salvation. But don't waste this time with how much you're committed to him, how much you're going to do for him, how you're going to build the temple for him, how you're committed to God and how you've done all the stuff that you've done and no. 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 In a sense, the end of chapter 2 is a re-sort of statement of chapter 1. Um, they can't paralambano him. They can't manipulate him. They can't sort of get him on board with them. They can't katalambana him. Uh, they can't grasp him or understand him or control him. But to as many as receive him, simply receive him, Lombano. He gives the right, he gives the authority, he gives the uh, uh, power to be children of God. Children born not of the will of decision that they made or the will of somebody else or having decided or blood. I was always born a Lutheran. I've been a Lutheran all my life. But born of God, born of God. What a devastating commentary on the situation of mankind that we love God and he doesn't trust us. And he's right. He just cleansed the temple. But we love you, God. We're on your side. In a sense, we're all really like, um, like, uh, like the sleazy salesman in Die Hard who, um, attempts to negotiate with a terrorist because, you know, he makes world deals and all that jazz. Haven't seen oh, Die Hard. It's my, one of my favorite Christmas movies. Comes in, puts his feet on the table. God, I know what you're going through, but I got a plan. You and me together, we're gonna we're gonna do wonders. God's like, yeah, I looked around for you. 
when creation was going on, I didn't see you. I think you're full of it. He knows what's going on with men. He doesn't need someone to bear witness to what's going on with men because he knows what's going on with men. And the only thing to say to that is, to say to that is, God save me. God save me. God rescue me. From me. God save me. From me. I want you to go to support.higherthings.org today. And I want you to give. Higher Things is doing a great job of providing you content in this pandemic. Parents, pastors, grandparents, all to resource young people. It's for them. But we get to come along too as we get instructed on how to teach them the faith. And if you care about the passing on of the faith to the next generation, like we care about the passing on the faith to the next generation, give today. Your tax-deductible gift keeps us and the work that we're doing. It's crazy to put on a study every day. But it's necessary. We need it. Parents are watching these studies with their kids. Parents are be resourcing themselves and teaching their, ki their kids. Youth leaders are using our studies in order to instruct kids. Uh, we have confirmation materials in order to help folks. Give today. Thank God for the work of higher things. Um, not with just with words, but with a little loving too. Tomorrow, chapter three. Were you born again? Or is something else going on there? Have a blessed day. I'm so glad to be amongst you. So glad to be back in my office. And I can't wait to get this thing cleaned up so that we can uh, continue our studies together. Rick, I, I'm sorry, man. Got to watch that. Uh, tell tell the pastor said you, you have to do some research for Bible study. Have a great day. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.